divine action, or the question of causality. Am I free, or is everything I do already determined? That is a question that has haunted philosophers for millennia. This is, in fact, a question that uh, the Bible deals with on a significant basis, and likewise Christian tradition has dealt with. But science also has to reckon with this because of the way that science functions. When we were asking the what question, if you remember last week, we're asking the what question about dropping the book, or about making the pot of coffee. Science has to have what's called a causal chain of events. There is something that causes something else, usually in the sense that something causes this which causes that which sets off a chain of events. For example, the coffee that we talked about last week. I turn on the coffee. When I turn on the coffee, that begins the process of the heating element bringing the water to a boiling temperature. Well, when that water reaches a boiling temperature, it then goes up a particular siphon tube and comes over the top of the coffee bed, if you have a regular coffee maker that, co that comes over the top, and that action comes over the top and begins to allow all of that to be able to brew and fall into the coffee pot, thus the coffee pot is warm, but at the same time, that also causes, when you hit the button, the warming plates to turn on to keep your coffee warm for a longer period of time, and not have to rely on the water boiling to simply keep its temperature. So all of those things are a causal chain of events caused first by me pressing the button. It all gets set off by a seemingly minute particular action that sets off a chain of actions that we can then deduce and describe causally. This is, in fact, what Thomas Aquinas says about God as the first mover, or the prime mover. In Thomas Aquinas's philosophy, he is an Aristotelian in philosophy, but a little bit distinct from Aristotle, though. When God begins to make moves in the universe, God is the initial instigator of the movement of the universe. But the way that Thomas explains this, rather, is that when we are thinking about God as a being, we have to identify the fact that God's being is perfectly in lockstep with God's action, such that his being is his action. So God cannot simply be something idle. God is something that is action itself, that is a sustaining action a causal action, and therefore God being the prime mover of the universe is not merely that God is the first ball to drop in the universe, but rather that God is the enlivening action of the universe itself. Now, again, that might seem very confusing to begin with, but this is very important because when we start asking ourselves if we as humans actually have free will, we have to swear a couple of important things. When God begins to make a movement, or when the universe itself begins to move, what exactly is our particular relationship to that first causal action? If, for example, I press the coffee button, and the water has no choice but to follow the laws of nature, which we would assume would be the case, or else coffee would be a haphazard experience at best. When we turn on the element, the water is going to reach boiling temperature, because that is how we have designed this to work. And that is how water works when exposed to an element that reaches a high heat. There's no choice but for the water to reach boiling temperature unless there is a malfunction. So the thing is, is that if the water had no choice because of an action that I have taken, does that water, therefore, is it determined that that water must reach boiling temperature? Is it determined by my action that this water has no choice but to do that? 
We would say yes. And we could say yes because we don't treat water as an agent. We don't treat water as having a will of its own to make a conscious decision. And again, back to the mystery of consciousness. But I have a will. I have a choice. I have a consciousness in which to make a decision to press the button. If God is, let's say, the divine button presser, does that mean that we as agents actually have free will? If God has begun the universe in such a way that every single interaction that happens after this, this motion outwards from God occurs, does that necessarily mean that we are living in a determined universe? Well, this is where we get into the theories of predestination, God wills something in a predestined sort of fashion, we have no choice but to fulfill a certain destiny of ourselves, or do we have the free will to do otherwise? And again, philosophers are going to say that free will primarily is the ability to do otherwise. Now, some would dispute this particular um, assertion, but that's generally what philosophers will say. But the reason why we're bringing all this back to divine action is that if God acts in the universe, if God is active in the universe, does that by necessity mean we are actually not agents? We actually don't have free will. We might think we have free will, but we actually don't. Such as the water, maybe if it had consciousness, thinks it has free will, but has no choice but to reach boiling temperature. That's a thorny subject. But Polkinghorne would like to suggest that there actually, on the physical sense of science, there is actually a built-in indeterminacy that he would argue is actually a statement that is more true about the universe than simply water has to boil. And it has to do with his exploration into quantum theory. Basically what quantum theory says is that there is a certain amount of indeterminacy as it comes to the relationship between very, 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 very small elements of reality and the way that reality actually functions. He uses the example that according to quantum theory, there should be a decay of certain elements under a certain period of time. However, because of, of the indeterminacy within quantum theory, we have to say that there is a probable outcome in which this happens at a certain point in time. It's probabilistic that this happens at this interval. It's not determined, but probable. And there, there's a bit of um, finagling to do with that uh, as it comes to how we're bridging the gap between science and faith, but suffice to say, there is a um, disagreement as to how or whether the way that the world functions really is determined or not. And if that is involving divine action, if we say that we as humans have free will in that, Polkinghorne is going to say that in that particular scope, these things are not irreconcilable but rather there is an element in which both God and us as agents have a certain amount of will involved, which he's going to talk about later, by the way, and that the world has a certain amount of determinacy to it. Water boils when we add that heating element to it. It has no choice but to follow the laws of nature. We'll get to where these two things start butting heads against each other in some cases, but Polkinghorne would say that as it comes to science and faith, both of these are descriptors of reality, true reality, but we have to be careful in saying exactly how either divine action or the physical sciences are determined or not. What can people believe and still be Christians? All that was necessary was for the disciples to believe that Jesus was resurrected, not for him to actually be resurrected. This person goes on to suggest that the body might have been stolen from the tomb. As a historian, I know better than most how flimsy the evidence surrounding Christ actually is. This is perhaps one of the most common assumptions about the evidence for Jesus. 
is exactly summed up in this question. And it's exactly summed up in the assumption at the end that as a historian, quote unquote, I know how flimsy the evidence for Jesus actually is. Now, the interesting uh, double-edged sword in that particular sentence is that historians, by their very study, have to use probabilistic arguments. The reason why this is very important to understand is that by stating that the arguments for Jesus are flimsy, the historian is actually making an a priori statement about the scholarship of which this historian believes is probable or not. In other words, based upon what this particular historian is saying, they are saying my particular belief about the probability of this is that it is flimsy. However, Polkinghorne attacks on two fronts here. He first of all says we really, really need to be careful about saying that the argument for Jesus is flimsy. Because, as we have noted, in fact, in several book studies past, that when we start making historical arguments, we are building evidence in the same exact way that physical science functions. We are building based upon our observation, based upon the likelihood of certain things to happen. However, simply because something is unlikely does not mean it does not happen. And the reason why this is also very important to note is that when we look at historical evidence for other things that we simply take for granted happen, and part of this is to do with our historical situatedness. Modern science in a lot of ways is capable of producing some incredibly important insight into the universe. However, we would not be able to do so in the manner in which we do so today if we did not have as reliable data collection as we have. We are able to record things instantaneously, mathematically, and likewise we are able to distribute that information instantly. We are able to record every single little minute detail of a particular situation whenever we are setting up our observance. The thing is, though, that is a particularly contemporary approach to transfer of information. Text communication was simply not the main way that people prior to the invention of the printing press in the 1500s communicated. We are living in a particularly influenced culture by the printing press, but that was not the primary way that people made communication with each other in the normal sense, and likewise in the documented sense when we get towards our ancient ancestors. This is where we have what's called the oral tradition of passing on information. And historians will tell you the primary way that people passed on information in many communities, especially poorer communities, is primarily through oral tradition storytelling. It was not by writing things down, because writing was prohibitively expensive in the ancient Near East. Likewise, writing was prohibitively consigned to those who were able to write. Literacy is not the same thing as saying someone can read and write. Literacy is saying that someone has faculty in the language, faculty in the ability to communicate. Sometimes someone being literate in those cases is being able to communicate verbally, orally, not necessarily by writing or by reading. In fact, we still have examples of cultures that do not have written language. Some of the Native American tribes did not have written language to pass on. It was simply not something that was the case. They were oral peoples, storytelling peoples. Why do I, now why do I bring this up? When historians say that evidence is flimsy, often, whenever, whenever historians are saying that, they're saying, well, there's no documents for me to look at. Do you expect there to be documents to look at when you're looking at an oral culture? That's simply, uh, again, that's simply not, not, not to ask the right question. And, but the amazing thing is, we do have documents, lots of documents, 
about Jesus in the extant manuscripts we have. In fact, we have more than six or 7,000 of them at the time. So first of all, the, uh, the little quip at the end, as a historian, I know how flimsy the, those accounts are. That is that person's belief about that. That is not the case when you start looking at this from a purely historical science. But the other question that is brought up here about the resurrection is the more important thing for Hulkinghorn. So, Jesus' resurrection. One of the things that Hulkinghorn is going to say about this is that the thing that makes Jesus unique in this case against other religious leaders is that instead of Jesus simply being this wise person, this, you know, this uh, wise guru that has a group of disciples that carry on his ministry after he dies, which, by the way, is the way that some historians talk about Jesus, when you actually look at the documented evidence of Jesus, the actual documents, such as the New Testament, such as the letters of the New Testament, such as the early church, such as Philo, the historian, such as others, or other Roman historians who make fun of Christians, Jesus' followers were not in the cookie-cutter shape of gurus. Jesus did not simply pass on his information or his teaching to his disciples, and then they went on with that after Jesus' you know, um, beloved death. Jesus' dis uh, disciples deserted him. Jesus was crucified on a tree in which the Old Testament itself says that that is someone who is under a curse. Cursed is anyone who dies upon a tree. And yet, these same deserters became believers when Jesus presented himself to them according to the literary, uh, the literary tradition of the Gospels and likewise the disciples' own testimonies. They became believers after they witnessed something of the body of Jesus. It was certainly not that they simply hallucinated that's not how people who deserted Jesus to save their skins all of a sudden become people who are willing to die for, for this particular belief. Again, this is all summed up very well in N.T. Wright's book, Surprised by Hope. But all to say is that when we start talking about Jesus' resurrection, that is the hinge point on which belief in Jesus is unique in comparison to other religions. Jesus, according to the literary canon of the Christian canon, is someone who was raised bodily and likewise was the first fruits of the bodily resurrection that those who believe in him will experience. So the thing is, is that when we take about the uh, scientific approach of, as Pulking Horn says, realism, truth about what the world is, both History and science are attempting to say the truth about what the world is. And to sum up a little bit of a quip of someone that basically, if the resurrection didn't have to do with the cells of the body, then we might as well just quit the whole project together. But if the resurrection really did bridge over into the actual makeup of my body, the makeup of human bodies, then we have something we've got to contend with. Besides Jesus' resurrection, on what basis does John Paul Gehorn develop his eschatology and general views about the world to come? In the physical sciences, there are certain laws of the universe in which all matter, everything that is physical, energy, so on and so forth, adheres to. One of them is the second law of thermodynamics, which simply states that order in a system, whether it be energy, matter, or whatever, is in its own particular way always prone and moving towards disorder. This is sometimes called the law of entropy. In other words, things that are in order are always pulled in a magnetized sort of way towards disorder. And the reason why that system is important to understand is because that explains so much of how we see and understand the workings of the physical universe. This is why we can say with a high degree of certainty that there is an expiration date on our sun. 
there is a physical expiration date in which in the order of the system in which it's working right now, if there are no outside forces of which we are unaware of at the moment, the sun has only a certain amount of gas that can be turned into fusion. And likewise, there is only a certain amount of time before the system that exists between the sun and the planets within our solar system becomes unsustainable. As stars begin to reach the latter portion of their life, they turn into different sorts of stars. And these stars, as we get farther along in the process, begin to grow dimmer, but get bigger. And so the red giants are those who are big, big, big stars. But the thing is that if our sun eventually turns into a red giant, basically what happens is that all of the rest of our planets within our solar system will eventually collapse into the sun. This, we can say, with a significant amount of certainty as it comes to the system of which it operates right now, is what is going to happen on a significantly long geologic time. In other words, ain't going to happen tomorrow. But, it, but according to the ways in which the law of entropy functions, it will be a reality at some significantly long distant future. That is a system that is able to describe so much of the way that the physical science sees in the world. It's not simply something we see on a cosmic scale, but something we see on a minute scale as well. We see this sort of move towards entropy even in subatomic sciences, in the decay of certain elements into other elements, in the particular ways in which biology functions, in which um, the ways in which our bodies age and end up introducing more and more possibilities for diseases, things such as that. The thing is, is that that's simply the way in which is an organizing principle of the universe. However, what Christianity says is that at the end, the end in this particular case being the end of the world or end of the age, at the end there will be a resurrection. And likewise, there will be a continuity between those who have gone before and those who have come after. In the same breath as we say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we also say that God is a God of you and me. And in that same way, if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are real people that will be made continuous with us, such that, as Polkinghorne notes, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not simply names or namesakes to be brought forward to be used by someone else, but they are real people whom we will actually interact with in the ways in which the resurrection functions, there is a significant amount of continuity, and likewise, a specific amount of continuity physically, because this involves physical bodies. Polkinghorne, therefore, wants to put out the notion that God who created all of the ways in which the universe functions, and likewise God who is active in the way that the universe functions, God's not a deist God that's way out here and simply the way that the universe functions is going on down here, but rather God is actively sustaining, actively engaging with the creation, then that means, at least in Polkinghorne's particular insight, that why can we not say that God can bring about a particular way of the universe that is not subject to the law of entropy? In fact, it's something that we actually have to say from a theological perspective, because when we say that we are experiencing the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are resurrected not to die again. Death itself is a type of discontinuity or a type of entropy, if you could kind of think about it that way. So there has to be some sort of organizing principle that fundamentally changes the way that the universe functions. Polkinghorne simply says, if God who can create the universe and who sustains it and is active within it has created a logical way for us to understand the law of entropy, why can there not be a new creation in which that particular um, impact on the physical universe is simply not a factor anymore? And Polkinghorn basically says, you know, how can we say what it will look like? Well, he simply holds his hands up, I think, wisely and says, wait and see. We don't have an actual insight into how that functions. 
we are simply told what our hope is, but we're not told the specifics. And for Polkinghorne, it's not helpful to look for specifics in this case, because this is something that God, in God's incredible complexity, brings about in the ways in which God desires. Jesus brings about these things in the way in which he desires, and not necessarily in the ways that we expect. So, as Polkinghorne says, this is something we can certainly say um, is something that we can hold in faith and hold scientifically and not see a discontinuity between these things. But we also see that there is, by very nature, something fundamental that has to change. And that's not something that needs to necessarily be a block to having faith that God will do something new, but rather that we can explain this both in the theological and the physical sense and say that there is more to come. Atheism, or the charge of atheism that religion is immoral. Richard Dawkins, famous atheists and biologists, has claimed in some of his books that to be religious is in fact to be immoral. In other words, to be religious, to believe something fake about the world, or to believe that God desires for you to kill these people or to destroy this civilization is, by its very nature, immoral. And therefore, um, to use the language of uh, one particular philosopher, atheist philosopher, that religion is simply child abuse, uh, to bring a child up in religious circles. Now, the response that Polkinghorne and others have made is that if you look at atheist regimes, even as recently as the 20th century, you will see that the description of um, simply religion as being a shoehorn in for being immoral simply cannot stand as an argument, because we have the examples of very, very specifically atheistic regimes, such as Stalin's regime under communism, like which, which takes his uh, his particular uh, sort of uh, living out of that from Karl Marx himself, who thought of um, religion as the opiate of the people, famous phrase from, from Marx, but even other regimes uh, that also want to sideline the idea of religion in total. We can look at communist regimes that take this sort of, um, this sort of thing in its totality within the 20th century, and we can see incredible a-humanitarian ways in which these particular regimes were completely immorally doing things. We, so the, the problem that we come up with is that it's not simply religion in its crusades or its various uh, religious wars that is the problem caused by religion. Rather, Polkinghorne says, no, this is, um, this is a little bit of a misplaced cause. It's sort of like saying that there is something that gives rise to something because of something. Polkinghorne wants to say, no, that is what we call constant conjunction. There is a conjunction between religion and violence, but it doesn't seem to be causative. In fact, if you look at many religions in the world, religions demand that you be humanitarian in a lot of ways. It seems that rather religion or irreligion theism or atheism is not causative or determinant on whether someone is violent or not. There seem to be a lot of different things that go into that, of which either one of these things can lead to values that cause violence. That certainly is the case. However, there is a significantly different sort of relationship that we can draw from these particular assumptions. Dawkins assumes that because you believe that God has made special some people and not special other people, that some people are worth it and not, and therefore that is an obvious immoral particular stance on the world. Now, Dawkins would be right if that was actually what religion said. <laughs> um, the challenge is, is that the force of this particular argument is dependent upon there being a causative relationship between religion and violence, of which many, many, many soci sociologists and likewise many atheists actually dispute with Dawkins. The challenge, though, is saying that 
rather than saying that there is a causative or a uh, causative relationship between violence or nonviolence, rather we have to say there is a way in which we can look at the relationship between a human and the world, and in which either theism or atheism can be a cause or causative relationship to be a bad actor. The way that Polkinghorne says is that simply the Christian diagnosis of that particular condition, regardless of whether you are of faith or not, is simply the concept of sin. That we have a fundamental part of ourselves that is bent towards the wrong or the ill. The way that some have described this is that we have a bend towards our personal selves. We are uh, so uh, ready to make our personal uh, realities, our personal convictions, this simply the way that the world should function, and therefore make every other person that's not like us fall in line with what we believe the world should be, be like. That is perhaps a excellent description of, of the concept of pride, the deadly sin of pride, but it also is a description of sin, putting ourselves over and above the needs or the wants of someone else. We are desirous of control perfect control. And when we are desirous of that, when we control others, or when we interpersonally are so bent on controlling the world, we actually put ourselves in the place of God, or in the place of whatever entity you want to name, if you're an atheist. And what that does is that is simply a descriptor of the way the world is. You know, we talked about the law of entropy, right? Uh, orderly systems are simply prone to disorder. You could say a little bit of that about sin. Th things that we do within our lives are prone to broken relationships in some mysterious way, shape, or form. It doesn't make it right, but at the same time it is descriptive. And it's not that religion bad, non-religion good, and neither is it the case where atheism bad, theism good. Rather, what we have to say is that there is a complex relationship between one's values and the way that one actually interacts with the world that goes way beyond simply theism or atheism, but rather is a search for the truth, of which, whether you're a theist or atheist, you are both searching for, in which Polkinghorne wants to say there is reliable ways that we can argue for Christian theism and the relationship that we have between the physical world and the sciences. If a proof of God's existence can be made, then how important is it? Such a proof could mean scientific standards, such as being falsifiable, and precisely define the points that are provable and when faith begins. As we talked about in the um, first big section of this book, talking about solid, airtight proof of God's existence for the 20th century and following is simply not something that modern philosophers and theologians talk about very often. Rather, what they talk about is the probabilistic approach. What is the most probable, most likely interpretation of the evidence presented that we have? And even with this, John Polkinghorne notes, by the way, uh, the two sections that she read in this section is from Nicholas Beale and from John Polkinghorne. They have different um, sort of um, they have different sort of ways of talking about this particular subject. Polkinghorne takes a more kind of theoretical approach in talking about this. Um, Nicholas Beale takes a little bit more uh, sort of uh, relational approach in understanding how this is functioning. What Polkinghorne it, what's important about Polkinghorne's section in this one, the JP section, is that he himself, as a physicist, knows that mathematics, even within mathematics, is not necessarily given over to airtight proof. And part of the reason why this is, is because uh, there are certain ways in which we can reliably describe the universe. That is absolutely true. Water will boil when you put a heating element in it. That, you know, this is simply one of those things that there, there's not another way that we can describe this unless there is some sort of malfunction. However, when we get down to the philosophical ways in which science functions, because remember, science is a method. It's a method of study. Science is foundationally 
a philosophy. We have certain ways in which we believe that truth is able to be observed in the universe. Science is born out of philosophy, about logical truths of the world. And when we say that, there are certain things that we can observe that are reliable, that are ways that we can understand truth, we are tempted to say that, well, this simply proves something. We can say that upon an argument of reliability. But again, we are making a, an argument on the reliable observation of what's happening, not necessarily upon an airtight sort of proof analysis. The challenge that Polkinghorne gives here is that science itself has a bit of a circularity to it, in which we are experimenting and finding results in which experiments are determinative of results, and results sometimes are determinative of how the experiment is set up in the first place. And so there's a, li there's a, there's a bit of a circularity in which we can say that there's some reliability in this particular thing, so that's why science should be repeatable. However, it is false to say that science simply by its own objective standards in a vacuum is not influenced by the ways in which we believe that this is supposed to function. Um, and so this, again, this might sound way heady, but the way that Polkinghorne is wanting to describe this is that when we are talking about proof of God, rather the better way of talking about this is that in the evidence that we can present for faith, is there, in fact, a more reliable way of saying that it is more reliable to say God exists than God doesn't exist? Again, go back to the earlier chapter when we talk about God's existence as a probabilistic reality. Not that God doesn't exist, but that God in the probabilistic argument is more solidly grounded as a likelihood. The main ones that Polkinghorne provided were the argument of the intelligibility of the universe. So why can we know something about the universe at all? Why is there a logical reality of the universe? There is an argument of the fine-tuning of our particular arising of life here on Earth. And there is the argument of the moral sense. Why do I morally know certain things? Or why can I morally discern certain things as good or bad in the moral sense? So is there proof of God? Polking is going to say, not in the sense that we're talking about proof. Not in the sense that we're talking about mathematical proof. However, in the same way that mathematical proof is not always given over to this kind of airtightness that we like to treat it with, it is the same way to say that there is a probabilistic way that we can observe and make arguments for the higher likelihood that God exists than for that not to be the case.